We read chapter 2 this morning and verse 17 of chapter 1 because the, the chapter break fits better between verse 16 and 17 of chapter 1. So really need to consider 1 verse 17 through to 2 verse 10 as all of chapter 2. But last night, of course, we didn't finish at the end of chapter 1. We finished at about verse 8 or so. So we'll pick up there and we'll get as far as we can into chapter 2, probably about three quarters of the way, I suspect. But because we didn't start on time, I can probably not finish on time or thereabouts. Anyway, we'll go, we'll go quickly. So let's start Jonah 1 verse 8, where we left off last night. Jonah 1 verse 8, Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? Whence comest thou? What is thy country? And of what people art thou? So recall last night, we, we painted the picture that this wasn't a, thanks brother, a hasty decision by Jonah. This was a planned decision that he chartered a boat. He wasn't a random passenger. He chartered the boat to go to Tarshish. And in the middle of the storm, he had refused to do anything to help the sailors. And it was the, the captain of the ropes who went down and got Jonah to say to him, cry to your God, why aren't you doing something to help us in the midst of this problem? Call upon your God. And Jonah had steadfastly refused to do anything to assist with the problems these men faced. The tension, of course, for Jonah is to, to help these Gentiles or to continue steadfastly in his plan to avoid going to Nineveh. And the irony, of course, is that these were Gentiles just like the Ninevites and either way Jonah was kind of stuck. He either helped the Ninevites or he helped these Gentiles. So in verse 8, the sailors want to know, is there a problem with Jonah's family? Is there a problem with his job? Is there some natural problem with him or his people that's caused this great evil to come upon them? What, what's, what's the root of this problem? And what they want Jonah to do is to confess. So they're pressing Jonah to give an answer for what's gone wrong. For him to say, here's the cause of this problem. You tell us why this is happening. So in verse 9, Jonah does. He says, I'm a Hebrew. I fear Yahweh, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Now if I can just refer you to your notes... In the first few pages, we talk about the structure of the book of Jonah. And we go through a broad structure and then a more detailed structure. And then there are, I gave you a structure per chapter. And if you've read the notes, you'll recall that each chapter is chiastic. Which means it's the, a series of ideas presented with a central point, And then the same ideas are repeated in reverse order to the end of the chapter. So for chapter 1... Verses 1 to 3 are an introduction and not counted. But then the chiasm starts in verse 4 and goes through to verse 16. Verse 9 is the central portion of the chiasm of chapter 1. That's the key idea, structurally, that the writer wants us to pay attention to. And there's a key idea in each chapter, which we'll get to as we, we track through the chapters. So in chapter 1, it's verse 9. We'll come to why that is in due course. But just note that this is a, a central verse. We need to pay particular attention to it as we continue. So Jonah says, I'm in Hebrew. And that's, that's probably unsurprising because they, they picked him up at Joppa in Israel, of course. And in calling himself a Hebrew, he calls himself by the name which other countries would have recognized. He didn't call himself an Israelite. He didn't say, I'm from Galilee or Gath Hefer. He said, I'm a Hebrew because that's what they would understand it's meaningful for them but it also allows them to identify his god which is what they wanted remember they'd cried to their gods and had no luck they'd asked them to cry to his god and he hadn't and then they'd cast lots to find out who the problem was well he says this is yahweh elohim the covenant god the god of heaven the god of sea and the god of land so the, for the Phoenicians, the competing god was Baal, who was a god of the sky, who could control the weather. So this is, of course, a, an argument that would be continued for hundreds of years, because in 
years to come it was still a God of Phoenicians of one kind versus a God of Israel in various battles through the history of Israel. The question for the sailors now is, well, can this God control the sea? Because that's the problem they've got. They really didn't care about anything else. Their problem is the storm. But Jonah's given them more information than what they're used to. Because Jonah said, this is a God of the sea. That's important. And a God of heaven. Well, that's important because that's where storms come from. And a God of land. Well, that's irrelevant to the sailors. They're not concerned with the God of the land. But what it does do is it, it gives these sailors a very clear picture of the breadth and scope of Jonah's God. Now, they might not feel subject to that same God, but they understand because they are, they're polytheistic, these men, right? They believe in a multitude of gods. So any particular God who can control the sea and the heaven and the land, that's a formidable God. It is no wonder Jonah is in trouble. If Jonah's upset that God, well, who's this man? What could that man have done to upset a God that powerful who can control all of those things? And why is he running away? So they ask Jonah a simple question, but he gives them information that would call them to ask a number of further questions. And if you think about the way the word represents these things, well, the sea is the nations, isn't it? And when God brought the dry out of the sea, well, that's Israel. And the heavens are where the powers are and where God dwells. So what Jonah says is, this is the God over all things. This is the supreme deity who controls all things. Well, that's a mighty God. And what Jonah doesn't do is to say, I'm afraid of my God before whom I've sinned. Jonah just said, I'm afraid of this God. I fear Yahweh. I reverence that God. He doesn't say, and I've done some foolish things and I'm in trouble. He just says, I fear that God. So what Jonah does, and what Jonah only does, is to declare his position. It's a statement of fact before them. He gives them no information about his occupation, about his family, about his land, about what he might have done, which are all the questions they ask. He doesn't answer that question. He just says, I'm in Hebrew and I fear Yahweh. But that's a, that's a fearsome God. And through the book, of course, you, you see that this God clearly is in control of all things. He controls the storm. He controls the heavens. He controls the fish. He controls the gourd. He controls the worm. He controls the sun. He controls all things through the book of Jonah. That's the God that Jonah fears. And so, consequently, verse 10, Jonah chapter 1, the men were now exceedingly afraid. They were afraid earlier of the storm. They are now exceedingly afraid, in verse 10, because of what Jonah told them in verse 9, and the implications of who this God is. So they say, as you would, why hast thou done this? Because they knew that Jonah had fled because he told them. So what have you done? What's the story? So you've got to understand now, of course, the disbelief these sailors have. How incredulous they might seem at this man. Why would you flee from a god of the sea by taking a sea voyage? That seems foolish, Jonah. When you're not even a sailor, why would you do that? Surely you know that that would imperil everybody on the boat. Well, he'd told them he was fleeing from his god. And in the first instance, that would mean to them, that was a god of the land. If you come with me to 1 Kings chapter 20, here's how they would think. Because they have a particular view of, of, of what a God is, and if they're unfamiliar with the, the idea of Yahweh, the, the God of Israel, they would think about Jonah's God the same way they'd think about their own gods, which is like this in 1 Kings 20 verse 23. 
1 Kings 20 verse 23. The servants of the king of Syria said unto him, Their gods are gods of the hills. Therefore, they were stronger than we, because we were fighting them in the hills. But let us fight against them in the plain, where the gods of the hills aren't. And surely we'll be stronger than they. So what they understand when Jonah says about his God, they have a God who's a God of their neighborhood, who's a God of their town, or the hill, or the forest, or wherever that God is domiciled. And that's the extent of that God. So when Jonah gets on the boat and says, I'm fleeing from the presence of my God, well, to them that means your God's in Jerusalem. And he's bounded by the borders of Jerusalem. Or he lives in the city. That's your God. He's a local deity like they all had. So of course you can run away and you can come under the, the auspices of other gods. Well, that's what they would have thought when Jonah said, I'm running away from God. Well, now, of course, they know that he's not just the God of Jerusalem or the temple. He's the God of the sea and the dry and the heavens. And so they are exceedingly afraid. And in horror, it means at this crime that Jonah's perpetrated. And what Jonah might have done, and the trouble he's put them in, of this unknown God, this powerful God, an unknown outcome in a worsening storm. And what's being stressed here is Jonah's failure before them. And again, again I mean, ironically, and it's, it's full of irony in chapter 1, he fails to fear his God, and these men don't. They fear yeah, Jonah reverences God, but he's not afraid of what God's doing. Jonah professed his faith. I fear Yahweh Elohim of Israel. The God of all things, everywhere. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. And he professes his faith in that God, while at the same time he tries to escape God's omnipotence and omnipresence. And by his very actions, he denies his own belief in that same God. That's how the sailors would think about Jonah. It makes no sense what he's doing. What Jonah's saying doesn't match up with what Jonah's doing. So you can understand why the sailors are confused and terrified because they don't know what's going on. Verse 11, Then said they unto him, What shall we do to you? that the sea may be calm unto us, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous. So they recognize now that their salvation depends upon one man. Without him, they can't live. What shall we do to thee that the sea will be calm for us? So now, instead of becoming God's object of salvation, he's now God's object of destruction, Jonah. The captain a pagan, who has yet to believe in the one true God, has pleaded with Jonah to influence Yahweh in whatever way he has, for Jonah to, to exercise any influence that he has with his God, that they might be saved. And Jonah's refused them just as he's refused God, while he's claiming to be a servant of the Most High God and so on and so forth. So clearly there's all kinds of hypocrisy in here from Jonah's, from the sailor's perspective of Jonah. We talked a little bit last night about what it might be like if your neighbour convicted you for your behaviour as a pagan and type, of, someone ungodly. But the real question is, what gives Jonah the right to withhold the truth from somebody who's clearly asking for it? Why would you do that? Why would Jonah refuse to tell them about his God, who can control all of these things, before whom they are terrified? Now, I do that. Because I decide that I won't tell some people about the truth for all kinds of irrational reasons. And I know that you do too. And Jonah's just done the same thing. And it takes the non-believers to convince Jonah to save them, 
for them to convict him in his hypocrisy and his unrighteousness, to press him into confession. Now, he's not willing to do this until it gets to the very last moment. So who are the people in my life that I have refused to offer salvation to because they were different from me? Because that's essentially the problem for Jonah. Because there are people about whom I've been willingly ignorant and who could now convict me for refusing to offer them salvation. They'll be there. They'll be there for you. Well, had Jonah, you know, just committed some straightforward crime, there would have been some straightforward punishment. But this was a crime of a, a magnitude beyond what these sailors had experienced before. This is a prophet of God, a successful prophet, who'd walked out on his God, disobeyed his God's direct instruction, and so they just don't know what will appease that God. They've tried sacrificing the cargo, but they don't know the nature of the God or what will satisfy this God. So Jonah has to be the one to do it. Verse 12, Jonah says, throw me overboard, and then the sea will be calm. I know that it's my fault, he says in verse 12. So there's enormous pressure on Jonah, of course. In, in what he does. The end of verse 11 reads that the sea wrought and was tempestuous. The storm's continuing to get worse. And as they stand there on the boat, with the waves getting higher and the storm getting worse and the rain and the wind and, and all of that, the scales of justice sit with Jonah. So what does he do? Well, Jonah's still got choices, of course. Option one, do nothing. There are sailors, they're at sea, storms happen at sea, that's a fact of life. You deal with that as a sailor, go back and do your job. And let's not think that Jonah didn't contemplate that. So that was option one. He didn't choose that, of course, but he could have done that. Option two, return to Joppa. Now, Jonah didn't want to do that because that was where he came from, of course, because that's, he fled from God there. Well, that would suit the sailors, wouldn't it? That, that's a quick option. Go back to Joppa and start again. That would have saved the sailors, potentially. Could have given Jonah to, the opportunity to go and repent before it was God and to start afresh. But Jonah couldn't bring himself to do that. And there's a very good reason why, I believe. Jonah had sailed west from Joppa, the opposite direction from where Nineveh lay. If you come to Jonah chapter 3, I think we're told the answer. Jonah chapter 3 and verse 4. Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. In verse 1 of chapter 3, uh, verse 2 rather, God says to Jonah, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So there's been a conversation between God and Jonah. Go and tell them what I've told you to tell them. So Jonah knows Destruction will come in 40 days for Nineveh. Jonah's chartered a boat to Tarshish. Why? Jonah just needed to get 40 days out. That's all. I just need to exhaust a 40-day period to avoid my responsibility for 40 days and judgment will come on Nineveh. That's it. Not complicated. I just need to wait. I'll charter a boat. It's going to take six weeks to get to Tarshish or more. And return journey, three months, I don't know. It just needs to be 40 days. And that's all. I'm not going to Nineveh. 
I just need to avoid my job for 40 days. None of it will be destroyed. My people will be saved. You can see it's, it's entirely logical what Jonah's doing. It makes very good sense in Jonah's mind. But he discards that option too. Option three, jump. He could have just sacrificed himself perhaps. He said, I'll just, I'll just go overboard myself. That would perhaps be a compassionate response. That he might have just gone and done it. And Jonah knew he's being disciplined by God. But Jonah didn't take that option either. He made the sailors do it. Throw me overboard. You do it. Jonah would still expect to drown. Perhaps it made the outcome easier to bear. I'm not sure. But Jonah asked them to execute judgment on him rather than executing judgment on himself. So as Yahweh cast the storm, the sailors cast lots and Jonah instruct them. And it's the resignation of death, isn't it? He expected to die when they cast him overboard. And for his disobedience, Jonah's cast into the sea of nations. Verse 13. Except that these men, these filthy Gentile dogs, these pagans, rode hard, in verse 13, to bring it to land, but they couldn't. And they refused to sacrifice Jonah. So they bent their backs, they pulled the ropes, they tried and tried and tried to make landfall. These are remarkable men, aren't they? An extraordinary spirit. Note in verse 11 that the sea wrought and was tempestuous. Now note in verse 13, the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. There's no way they're going to make land because this is a, a God-directed storm. So God's against the sailors in the boat. The sea is actively against the sailors. They're divinely prevented. The casting overboard, therefore, of Jonah. And Jonah asked him to do it. He was willing and voluntary. And in this begins the, the parable of of Jonah as a type of the Lord. He was the willing sacrifice who was put to death for the salvation of others. They laid their hands upon him and they lifted him and they cast him to death. And it's a glorious type that exists through the book of Jonah. But it's different also. Because these sailors, they weren't like Pilate, and they weren't like Caiaphas, who just wanted to put the man to death. These were, these were heathen, these men, who, who showed a greater moral understanding than Jonah. They understood in some crude form the character of this God. When the Lord was sacrificed, he would pray for forgiveness for those who would put him to death. Jonah didn't do that. So while he's a wondrous type in other ways, he's a, he's a terrible type in others. Here, the sailors themselves pray for forgiveness. These sailors, Gentile converts from the first overseas preaching effort, which Jonah had tried to avoid, and here he is converting nevertheless. And these pagans showed more concern for one single prophet of Israel than the prophet of Israel showed for an entire nation. And they did what they could to save him. Ultimately though, of course, verse 14, they realise they can't. And so they do the only thing they think left to do, which is what, of course, Jonah has thus far failed to do. They cry unto Yahweh, we beseech thee, O Yahweh, in verse 14, we beseech thee, 
let us not perish with this man's life and lay not upon us innocent blood. All key words, aren't they? For there, O Yahweh, hath done as it pleased thee. They couldn't be sure they were doing what God wanted in the way that God wanted them to do it, but they were trying. And you can understand that they probably feared themselves for their own lives because they were taking the life of one of Yahweh's chosen servants. So it's a really hard position Jonah's put these men in. Nevertheless, verse 15, they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Once they had prayed, What's Jonah thinking while these men are praying to his God? Does it, does it prick him at all? That they are crying to his God, doing whatever they can think of for his God, and he steadfastly doesn't. Is there a shred of compassion in the man? We don't know what Jonah thought. It's an interesting exercise to consider it. But in the end he didn't, and he accepted that death was his due. That was the wages for his actions, and he stood by to be executed. So they do. And the sea ceased from her raging. It means literally that it stood still from its anger. And immediately, it's all calm. The wind stopped, perhaps the clouds cleared, it's a sunny day, the ropes creak, the sail flaps a bit, and that's it. What would you do then? Well, that was strange, wasn't it, fellas? Never seen the like of that before. What do you make of that? What kind of God is that? Well, I don't know how the conversation on the boat would go next. But it's fascinating to consider what these men did. Perhaps they just stood around lost in their thoughts at the power of this God who can calm the sea like that. Perhaps they wondered about the specialness of this man that would cause his God to do that in a moment. Absolutely they were part of something significant and special and they knew that. Verse 16, then the men feared Yahweh exceedingly and offered a sacrifice and made vows. Now that had proof, hadn't they, that this was a God of the heaven and the sea and the dry. They feared the storm in verse 5. There was terror in the storm in verse 10. Now we're through to reverential fear of this new God in verse 16. They've got no cargo left, there's probably damage to the ship, and, and they limp back to shore. And do what? I think they go to Joppa, these men. In fact, not, I don't think, I'm, I'm convinced they go to Joppa. I'm convinced they go to the temple, actually, these men. They offered sacrifice to Yahweh vowed vows before him with thanksgiving for deliverance and forgiveness. They'd feared Yahweh more than they'd feared Jonah. And they gave Yahweh a respect that Jonah should have given him. And they were obedient to this new God. And then you think about these men, that they're quite remarkable. Remarkable. And while they're thinking these things, verse 17, Yahweh had prepared a great fish, already prepared. Not Yahweh prepared then, Yahweh had prepared. And Jonah's in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, of course, this is overflowing with symbology, this verse. Of course, that takes us straight to the New Testament. The Lord's going to be in the belly of the tomb. It's wonderful, though, because it's a clear signpost forward from Jonah. And the Lord would quote this in Matthew chapter 12 and he'd reference this story as a literal event 
Regardless of how fantastical it might seem, the Lord references this as fact. And as wondrous as it was for the Lord to reference it back, it was also wondrous for him because it referenced forward. Because he knew Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly and was then expelled. And though I'll be crucified and I'll be in the belly of the earth, I will be expelled from the tomb. So it was a wondrous reassurance for the Lord that Jonah was vomited up by the fish because it pointed forward for him faith in his father, comfort in the plan that the things that have been said will come to pass and I will be at the right hand of God. So the Lord could take all kinds of comfort from the story of Jonah. But for the immediate audience there were other things. The fish was prepared by God that it might swallow Jonah. And swallowing is never good in the scripture. In fact, it's almost always very bad when things get swallowed. Death, destruction, and being overcome. It's a very hostile word. The initial inference, of course, is that God's going to execute Jonah with the fish. And, and he wasn't, but the sailors wouldn't have known that, not that they probably saw the fish. And Jonah didn't know that. For Jonah, this is a vehicle of destruction. And being swallowed by the fish meant death. Well, why not? Why not save Jonah some other way? Why not some of the floating cargo, the flotsam and jetsam off the boat that Jonah could have grabbed hold of? Jonah didn't have to go into the fish, did he? So the fish itself is significant. And it really is. In your notes, I've made the argument this is the basking shark. And there's some photos of different kinds of fish. The, word, the Hebrew word is just the word dag, which can just mean a sea creature of some kind. So there are really only three options for what this can be. The whale shark, which is big and appropriate, and it's a mouth feeder. It swims along with its mouth open, collects little fish, but its esophagus is too small. For a man to fit through. You don't find them in Mediterranean either. Sperm whale, big enough. They live in the Mediterranean and it could do, but the better is probably the basking shark. It's also just a vacuum cleaner, swims along at about two knots an hour, takes thousands of litres of water an hour, and it's got a huge esophagus, large enough for a man to fit through. And in the photo I've got, you'll see there's a, a diver swimming by the fish. They are unafraid of humans. They're large and docile, these things. But the fish has to teach Jonah a lesson. So this was God controlling the uncontrollable. Nothing's, nothing at all is left to chance in the story. doesn't really matter what kind of fish it is, by the way. I mean, I'm, I think we're right about the basking shark, but the, the kind of fish isn't the point. The nature of the fish and what the fish does is really what God wants to teach, wants to teach Jonah. So verse 2, Jonah chapter 2, uh, verse 1 rather, Jonah prays unto Yahweh, his God, out of the fish's belly. So verse 2 is at the end of the time in the fish. You know, I think it's wonderful, really. It's just a little reminder. There are, there are lots more. It's a reminder it doesn't really matter where we are or what we're doing, we can offer prayer. And here are some that I had just had a quick skim. It, it doesn't require formality in many occasions. Jonah can offer a prayer from a fish's belly. We can offer prayer anywhere, anytime, for no reason at all other than the, the opportunity arises to offer prayer. Pray without ceasing and so forth. Well, Jonah does, because the issue is that we offer prayer rather than waiting for the right time. But it's an interesting set of circumstances, because for a, a Near Easterner, given that they didn't like the sea, 
drowning was an entirely ignominious way to die. In fact, it's humiliating for them because they didn't like the sea. So Jonah then cries out in verse 2, By reason of his affliction unto Yahweh, Yahweh heard me, out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. So verse 2, if you like, acts as a, a summary of Jonah's time from leaving the boat to being in the fish. And then through to verse 7 is the raw emotion of a man drowning as he sinks. Well, Jonah does cry out in affliction. And the sailors cry out in affliction. And they're all crying out for the same thing. The point of which, of course, is that prayer is really the only way we have to be delivered from any difficulty that we face. And the sailors recognised it, and Jonah, of course, knew it. And the hope would be that God would respond with deliverance. And Jonah cries for the same reasons, out of the belly of the fish. Well, here's what Jonah's saying. So Jonah's it's the same thing twice, a, a parallelism in Hebrew. Second half of the verse restates the first half of the verse. But notice what it doesn't do is that it doesn't name the fish as Sheol. So the belly of hell here in verse 2 is not the belly of the fish. So Jonah doesn't understand that when he's in the fish, he's in hell. That's not what Jonah says. His affliction is in the belly of hell. So what Jonah actually means is, I'm in the womb of the sea. I've been swallowed. And I'm in the belly or the womb of the sea itself. So you come over to Isaiah 5. Here's a, the same kind of idea. So Jonah's just personifying the sea, and he's giving it the form of a, a person. So in Isaiah 5, verse 14, you see the same idea. Isaiah 5, verse 14. Isaiah said, Therefore... Hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. Their glory, their multitude, their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. So what Jonah is saying is, the fish is essentially just a figure. I've been swallowed by hell right down to its belly, and I'm stuck right in the depths of the sea. Swallowed by the grave right down into its belly. So what he's doing while he's in the fish, is telling the story of getting to being in the belly of the fish. He tells the story of the sinking, he tells the story of the weeds, he tells the story of the, the blackness of the crushing weight of the water, fading light, fading hope, and a last ditch prayer to God from whose pleasant presence he fled that the same God he's rejected might not reject him. Ah, oh, the hypocrisy of all of that. I don't want to do what I've been asked to do, but I'd like you to do what I'm asking you to do, if that's all right. Now, Jonah's got some currency with God. I appreciate that, because he's been a faithful prophet. And faithful people do unfaithful things. David was a faithful man and did some terrible things, but God would listen to David. And God would listen to Jonah. This is the first bad thing we've seen of Jonah's life. We don't know everything else, but... By and large, we assume he lived a faithful life. But here's the real irony. Exodus 33, verse 19. I'll just read it for you. Exodus 33, verse 19. This is Jonah wanting God on Jonah's terms. Exodus 33, verse 19. He said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. I will proclaim the name of Yahweh before thee and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And show mercy on whom I will show mercy. God talking to Moses in Exodus 33. But the language of that is interesting. Because it's Psalm 18. 
And what's remarkable is that in Jonah's affliction, Jonah goes to the Psalms. In fact, Jonah goes to the Psalms over and over again in his plight. This is not an exhaustive list of the references Jonah makes in his own psalm, but they are a fair number of them. In Psalm 18, we're told this from verse 4. The sorrows of death compassed me. The floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress I called upon Yahweh, cried to my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even into his ears. That's exactly what Jonah's done, and you can see why he'd go to Psalm 18. And God responds in Psalm 18, verse 16. He sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. Well, sometimes the answer to prayer is no. Sometimes the answer is not yet. But Jonah's psalm, oh man, this is a, this is a remarkable, a soaring psalm of celebration of the care of God, of what God can do for the afflicted, of what God can do for us when we're in distress. It's a remarkable thing to say while he's drowning. Quite extraordinary. And it took till that point for Jonah's pride to start to break and for his own will to start to bend. Well, this is a psalm that comes to Jonah that would ascend to God, that God would know his affliction and he'd hear him. Verse 3, because, and listen to what Jonah says, he's, he's very clear. In the deep he goes, Thou hadst cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas. The floods compassed me about, thy billows, thy waves passed over me. And Jonah knew where this had come from. This is all God's doing. Jonah was clear about that. But it suggests that when Jonah's thrown overboard and before the fish, there's a little bit of time that he's swamped by the sea and the waves. When the waves go over top of him and he recognizes this is God. And when Jonah says, in the midst of the seas, it means heart. This is Jonah continuing with the personification of the sea. He's been in the belly or the womb. Now he's in the heart of the sea. And it's probably this the Lord references in Matthew 12, verse 40. Because the Lord said, As Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth which is the language that Jonah uses to be in the heart of the sea. And when Jonah says, the floods compass me about, the words better rendered river, which gives us two interpretations. To later readers of the book of Jonah, so for those around the time of the, the ancient Greeks and the Romans, the Mediterranean was a river. That's how they considered it. In fact, they would consider the entire, the entire ocean to be a river, but for some of them, it was the entire ocean. So in some of the later works um, of the famous Greek writers, they would write about the sea as a river. So when Jonah says, the, f the river compasses me, that's what they might think. But probably, um, and, and a, a more interesting one, really, is that it's probably a current in the sea rather than the whole sea itself. And in the Mediterranean, the current flows from west to east. So it would take Jonah <laughs> towards Joppa. And if he stayed in the current, he'd bump into the coast of Israel. And then the current goes north. So what Jonah probably means is he's just dragged along by the current and he goes under the water. Could Jonah swim? Probably not. Was he fully clothed? Probably. So Jonah's going to go under, in a natural sense, reasonably quickly. And then Jonah just goes, and you can see the references on the screen over and over again to the Psalms. Psalm 42, for example, he says this. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Well, that was the God that Jonah had left behind, from whom he'd fled. 
Psalm 42 verse 3, My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? Well, that's what the sailors had said to Jonah on the boat. Psalm 42 verse 4, When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, for I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God, with the voice of joy and praise, with the multitude that kept holy day. Well, Jonah had been in the house of God, and he'd left it to avoid his commission and to throw in the towel from the temple. In Psalm 42 verse 7, which is particularly the bit Jonah uses, Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts, all thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Well, here's the hard question, though, brothers and sisters. And I, see how you go with this. I failed this. Jonah's pulled under by the weight of the, his clothes and the, the billows and the waves, the pull of the current, and he goes under. Cast in the sea, Jonah thinks God's turned his back, as you might. That he's cried to God, and I'm drowning, and there's no hope. Psalm 31 verse 22. I said in my haste, I'm cut off from before thine eyes. Nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplications when I cried unto thee. In Psalm 31 verse 22. Well, he's turned his back on God, and now he wants God's help. Forgets God when things aren't going his own way. He wants God when he wants God. Well, that's, that's not how God goes. Well, in verse 5 of Jonah 2, he's drowning. The depths close about. The weeds about his head, and he recognizes that this is really hopeless. There's probably no way out. So Jonah's giving way to the burden of impending death and in verse 5 when he says when he uses the word depth that's the same word used in Genesis 1 verse 2 when darkness was upon the face of the deep so this is the chaotic dark unbridled uncontrolled place that the sailors feared and that the Jews didn't like on the sea it's that the chaos of Genesis 1 verse 2 and Jonah recognises there's no God there. It's just darkness on the face of the deep and I'm in the belly of that place. And you can, you can sense his despair. Because that's what the, the world was like before there was light and before God moved upon the waters. So in verse 6 of Jonah 2, down to the bottoms of the mountains, the earth with her bars was about me forever, yet thou hast brought up my life from corruption, O Yahweh my God. So for Jonah, well there's nowhere else to go, is there? He can only go down. And he sinks to the sea floor or thereabouts, surrounded by the mountains and the sea, surrounded by the sea, buried in the heart of Sheol, surrounded by the bars and gates of the grave. Take a step aside from Jonah. Every culture has a story like this, in some way or shape or form, some kind of underworld mythology. We saw last night the Greeks had Hades, and you'd pay your fare to the ferryman, and he'd take you across the river Styx, and then you'd go into the underworld. Well, that was their story. The Babylonian had a, a different argument. Their realm was surrounded by seven walls. It was ruled over by Urkala, who ruled that place. And he had to get through the seven gates to get to the dark place where the dead resided. And so on they went. And every other culture has a story like that of some kind. Well, for the Jews, it's the prison. The prison house of Sheol. Which is why Jonah talks about the bars and the gates. And if you think about Samson... Well, it's the bars and the gates that fortify you and lock you in, which Samson had to break out of the walls to escape. So that's the, that's the kind of story Jonah's painting. I'm trapped in this prison house, and there's no escape from prison. Impenetrable city, 
surrounded by a mountain fortress, and that's the Valley of Sheol. Well, how long does that take? I've got a little note in your, in your notes about how long that might have taken. Jonah doesn't drown. And when Jonah's writing this psalm, clearly he's conscious from when he goes into the water all the way down to the bottom because he can retell the story from the belly of the fish. But it isn't long. And what it does say is how remarkably well-timed the fish is. There's a very clear process for drowning that I've got in your notes. Maximum time to drown, 10 minutes. Probable time to drown, 3 minutes. 6 minutes for probable drowning, but 3 minutes before you're unconscious. And then there's loss of oxygen to the brain, then complete loss of oxygen, and then you die. And it's predictable, well-timed, and everyone's exactly the same. What it means for Jonah is God's got to time the fish to the second. When it says in earlier on God's prepared a fish, he really has to just the moment for the fish to get Jonah before Jonah drowns. All Jonah sees is the door slamming on the prison house and the key in the lock and the lock being turned and there's no escape. But think about this. Under that kind of stress, when you're drowning or when you're under some other kind of enormous pressure like that, the brain does funny things. Quite funny things. It's driven, and, and we can't control it, particularly in drowning, it's driven for survival. So it will eliminate all other things to, to keep you alive. So all its energy will go there, which means that you lose the ability to make rational decisions. You can't suddenly plan what you might do if you're saved. You're not thinking about tomorrow's lunch. You're thinking only about the immediate circumstances. There's panic initially. You hold your breath. After a while, you can't do that because the body's starting to cannibalize itself. And the brain's just fighting to keep you alive. In that time, all of the kind of the fluff of life, if you like, is stripped off. And the brain reverts to type. It goes to the places it's familiar with. So the things that you think about the most are the places the brain goes when it's under pressure. Because that's familiar. Because the brain doesn't like to waste energy. It's all about efficiency. So it goes to the places that are the most efficient. The well-trodden path. Well, for Jonah... That's the Psalms. He can quote. I mean, you saw them. There are the thick end of 20 references in the Psalms, in Jonah's Psalm, while he's drowning. Think about that for a minute. He's a stubborn, bigoted, willful, proud Jew who has flagrantly disobeyed his God. Yet when you strip Jonah's mind bare, what is it? It's the Psalms. That's what's left when the fluff of Jonah's life is gone. And you know, when you stand before the Lord at the judgment seat, he's going to say, is the mind that is in me the mind that is in you? Let's just strip away the fluff and see where your brain goes the most often. Well, I squirmed a little bit, to be fair, when I read that, because I thought, if I had 180 seconds left, would my mind go to the Psalms? On the cross, Psalms. In the belly of Sheol, Psalms. Brother Brendan, possibly not.
which was an awkward question when I asked myself. So I thought, though I might be able to, to criticise the willfulness of Jonah, when I put myself beside him, I thought, but he outshadows me in all kinds of other ways. Because that was his mind compared to mine. Which is quite remarkable. Because that's a mind steeped in the word. But Jonah knows that he is really about to die. Let's finish on verse 7. When my soul fainted within me, Jonah said, I remembered Yahweh, and my prayer came into thee, into thine holy temple. And just as it was in chapter 1 and verse 6 with the sailors, prayer is presented as the key to salvation, where we might otherwise perish. And in those seconds, Jonah does. And in Psalm 16, we're told this. Psalm 16, verse 8 to 11. I have set Yahweh always before me, because he is at my right hand and I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures. The very presence from which Jonah fled, he knew in that presence is fullness of joy. Jonah's not, he's not a willful, problematic son. He's a faithful and remarkably godly man who has an, a single issue with God in a life of complete dedication to the truth. And a remarkable relationship with his father. Full of the Psalms. And in that moment, in that white hot furnace of pressure for Jonah, God acts. And at the right second, this enormous fish appears, having been prepared. And Jonah might not remember passing through the gullet of this great fish. He may have passed into unconsciousness just before. Certainly, his time's up. And either he thinks he'll drown, or if he's alive in the fish swallowism, he thinks that's it. Either way, there's no coming back from this. And Jonah knows he's about to die. And still, oh, he's tough. He's a tough man, Jonah. Because he still has an argument. But let's do that after morning tea.